Welcome back to Reliving the War and welcome to 1996. Last week we looked at the very last television ratings battle of 95 from the 18th of December. The following week on December 25th, WCW aired an unopposed episode of Nitro and two days later, Starcade 1995 took place from Nashville, Tennessee. Let's look at the Christmas Day episode of Nitro and the Starcade show before looking at the very first Raw vs Nitro battle of 1996. This episode of WCW Nitro was taped the week prior, so we're still in Augusta, Georgia. The show had a heavy focus on the Starcade triple threat match between Lex Luger, Sting and Ric Flair, which was good to see. Remember that the WWF seriously struggled when promoting In Your House 5. Lex Luger defeated Scotty Riggs with the torture rack at around the 6 minute mark. This means the total package defeated both American males over the course of two television weeks. The man called Sting defeated Big Bubba Rogers in an average 5 minute bout, Dean Malenko made Mr JL top out in under 4 minutes, and finally Randy Savage defeated the nature boy Ric Flair by disqualification in a decent 15 minute match. Lex Luger hit the ring to attack Savage which led to the Stinger coming out to attack Ric Flair. Randy Savage and Sting had words with each other as the show went off the air and yeah all in all it was a pretty good no nonsense episode of Nitro. We also got promos from Lex Lex Luger, Sting and Ric Flair throughout the broadcast. Of note here is that Jimmy Hart formed an alliance with the Nature Boy that would see the Mouth of the South offering his managerial services to Flair at Starcade. Next up we have the Starcade 1995 results. This pay per view was themed around the World Cup of Wrestling. WCW superstars competed against New Japan superstars throughout the show. The company who got the most wins would be given the World Cup. Jushin Thunder Lager defeated Chris Benoit in an excellent opening match. Nobody really talks about this one when discussing great pay per view openers, but give it a chance when you have the time. Koji Kenamoto defeated Daz Wunderkind Alex Wright in the following match, meaning New Japan started things off with a two point lead. The total package Lex Luger beat Masahiro Chono via submission while Johnny B. Bad defeated Masa Saido via disqualification to tie up the scores. It was an over the top rope disqualification, that stupid rule that WCW would enforce when they sometimes remembered about it. Shinjiro Otani then beat Eddie Guerrero in an excellent match while Randy Savage won his match against a young Tenzan to make things three apiece. In the final match of the World Cup of Wrestling, Sting defeated Kensuke Sasaki and WCW reigned supreme over New Japan Pro Wrestling. The Nature Boy Ric Flair won the triangle match via countout. This wasn't a typical three way bout by the way, the guys could tag in and out which makes zero sense but let's just roll with it. Sting and Luger were on the outside of the ring and the Stinger was a about to climb back inside, but Lex grabbed Sting's arm. Sting was unable to get back inside the squared circle and so Ric Flair was now the number one contender. The WCW title match happened immediately afterwards and thanks to the four horsemen, Ric Flair was able to become the WCW champion once again. After the show went off the air, the fans in attendance were treated to a dark match, One Man Gang vs Kensuke Sasaki for the US title. A botched finish saw One Man Gang win the United States Championship when referee Randy Eller counted Sasaki's shoulders to the mat, even though Sasaki kicked out at two and a half, resulting in the match getting restarted and Sasaki immediately winning the belt back. WCW, however, would pretend the restart didn't happen when replaying the match on TV, and therefore, this botch led to the one man gang actually becoming the new WCW United States Champion. All in all, even though it's an odd show, Starcade did deliver in the ring. The vast majority of wrestling fans in 1995 didn't know who some of these New Japan guys were, but still, Starcade wasn't bad at all and WCW done a good job in building up the triple threat and world title matches. WCW wouldn't have a pay per view coming up in January, but they did have a Clash of the Champions special on January 23rd. We'll look at that when the time comes. 
This is going to be a strange episode of Reliving the War thanks to the format WWF Raw went with on January 1st, 1996. Raw only presented two matches on this evening and a replay of a pay-per-view match. We have the Raw Bowl and, wait for it, Diesel vs King Mabel. The Raw Bowl took up nearly half of the Raw presentation so it will have to go up against multiple WCW segments. Anyway, Raw is taped from New York, Delaware and Nitro is live from Atlanta, Georgia. Let's start with Raw and look at the whole Raw Bowl elimination match first. The WWF broadcast opens up with a video hyping the Raw Bowl. Vince McMahon talks about the cheerleaders and marching band in attendance while lacing his speech with football puns. This would carry over into the match commentary. Vince talks about the superstars competing in the match while also announcing that the Nacho Man, the Huckster, Scheme Gene and Billionaire Ted are also going to be on Raw. Yes, this is the start of the infamous skits that saw the WWF take shots at World Championship Wrestling. These skits would get darker and much more personal, up to the point where the USA Network ordered McMahon to stop airing the segments. Remember that Alundra Blaze just dumped the WWF women's title on Nitro a few weeks ago, so maybe this was a knee-jerk reaction to WCW's antics, but still, we'll get to all of that as it unfolds on TV. Anyway, the Raw Bowl match features four tag teams. The Smoking Guns, Yokozuna and Owen Hart, Razor Ramon and Savio Vega, and finally Sid and the Kid. This is an elimination match. Any wrestler can get tagged in at any time. Physical contact has to be made with an opponent before tagging out. So, for example, if Sid and the Kid both get tagged in, they have to wrestle each other before tagging out. And finally, a team can call one timeout at any point in the match. During the entrances, Razor Ramon was presented with some gold roses sent by Goldust. The bad guy took it out on Goldust's little servant as the bizarre one looked on. The Raw Bowl starts off with Owen Hart and Bart Gunn. The rule about potentially wrestling your own tag team partner is used nearly straight away when Owen tags in Billy Gunn, but Billy and Bart do a quick hip toss spot that leads to a fake out. The Smoking Guns then tag in Owen Hart and Yoko Zuna. The King of Hearts is hesitant to go at it with Yoko, the two men get in the ring and Yoko Zuna hits Owen with a giant shoulder block, Owen tags in Savio Vega, Yoko Zuna tags in the kid and so far the action has been quite fast paced. Razor Ramon and Owen Hart get a chance to do some work in the ring but there isn't enough time for things to settle. It's quick tag after quick tag followed by explosive offense to start things off here on Raw. Bart Gunn hits an impressive vertical suplex on Psycho Sid before tagging Owen back into the match. We go to commercial break as Yokozuna is doing a number on Savio Vega and when we return, Yokozuna has forgotten how to wear a t-shirt it seems. I'm finding it very hard to say much about the match so far, it's following the form formula of tag, wrestle for 20 seconds, tag, wrestle for another 20 seconds, rinse and repeat. Things finally heat up a little when Razor tags in to face the 1 2 3 kid. The bad guy hits a fall away slam, which leads to the kid calling a timeout. The bad guy hits the Razor's Edge anyway, which you'd think would lead to a disqualification, but no. Ted DiBiase distracts the referee, Sid hits Razor from behind with a clothesline, the 1 2 3 kid makes the cover, and Razor Ramon and Savio Vega get eliminated from the match. We come back from the second commercial break and the match finally gets a chance to slow down a little. Owen Hart and Bart Gunn have a nice offensive exchange. I like this spot here where Yokozuna accidentally hits the bonsai drop on his own tag team partner, leading to Owen getting pinned even when Yokozuna tried to call for a timeout. So we're down to Sid and the Kid and the Smoking Guns. The heels do well here in breaking the rules and distracting the referee. Sid in particular looked pretty good during certain spots as Billy and Bart took a beating in the ring. The match comes to an end when Razor Ramon interferes, pushing the 1-2-3 Kid off the top rope and on the psycho Sid. Billy rushes over to get the pinfall win. And yeah, the Raw Bowl is over. I've really mixed feelings about this match. I feel it would have been better to see it live in the arena thanks to how fast paced it was, but on TV it came across as a little messy. It also took up over half of the Raw broadcast, meaning this whole Raw Bowl matchup is going head to head with two Nitro bouts along with a promo. 
Nitro kicks off with Eric Bischoff telling us that Ric Flair is the 12 time world's champion and the Nature Boy will face Hulk Hogan in the main event. Randy Savage wants to try and get a little revenge in the first Nitro match as the Macho Man takes on Arn Anderson. Arn goes on the attack straight away but Savage is absolutely unhinged, taking the fight to the outside in the opening moments of the match. For the second time since Nitro began airing on TNT, Eric Bischoff gave away a WWF Raw match result. He lets everyone know who won the Raw Bowl and we aren't even five minutes into Nitro. Have a listen. And in the uh, Raw Bowl, Toilet Bowl, whatever that's called, Smoking Guns won it. Forget about it. Stick right here. We are live. This Randy continues his attack in the ring until Anderson begins zoning in on the Macho Man's injured arm. Double A systematically wears Randy Savage down with a range of offensive moves targeting the injured limb of the Macho man. Savage does try to mount a few comebacks but Randy either hurts himself by using his injured arm or Anderson just shuts the macho man down before he can get started. After a referee bump, Arn Anderson pulls out a pair of brass knucks but Savage is able to take the knucks away from Double A, nailing the horseman with his own weapon and scoring a pinfall win. Brian Pullman and Chris Benoit hit the ring, the macho man bails, and yeah, not a bad match to start things off on Nitro, but nothing groundbreaking either. Our next match has me very interested though, it's Chris Benoit taking on Lord Steven Regal. Regal's first match here on Reliving the War 2 by the way. As Steve Regal comes to the ring, Eric Bischoff once again lets fans at home know that the Smoking Guns won the Raw Bowl match. It's kind of striking that Eric Bischoff is going full throttle here with giving away match results when he had been so quiet over the past few weeks. My guess is that Bischoff knew about the upcoming Billionaire Ted skits that were about to air on Raw, but still, interesting times on both shows. Lord Steven Regal takes Benoit down to the mat instantly, but the Canadian crippler nips up. To put Benoit back down, Regal delivers a series of headbutts. Benoit is able to lay in a few punches but the crafty Steve Regal manages to out-wrestle his opponent, wrenching on Benoit's neck and following up with another impressive takedown that results in Regal gaining the upper hand. Compare what we have seen here to the Bret Hart vs Bob Backlund main event a few weeks ago on Raw. All four men can be considered technical grapplers but Benoit's intensity along with Regal's insanely high level of catch as catch can wrestling makes for a much more enjoyable and intriguing match and we're only a few minutes into the bout. Regal hits Benoit with a few open palm strikes but Benoit hits a nice German suplex to even things up. Regal answers with a butterfly suplex but his lordship can't get the pinfall victory. Benoit goes to the top rope and misses the diving headbutt, leading to Regal nailing a series of headbutts and slaps to Benoit that looked pretty impressive. The match ends a little abruptly however, Benoit goes for a top rope plancha but Regal moves out of the way. Regal rolls Benoit back into the ring and scores the pinfall win. It's another case of a match just beginning to get really good but it's unfortunately stopped short due to TV restrictions. Thankfully we would see a ton more Benoit vs Regal matches in the year years that followed and they were always hard hitting. After the Benoit match, Arn Anderson and Brian Pillman come to the ring for an interview with Mean Gene Okerlund. Pillman says that the Horseman's win-loss record here tonight on Nitro is awful, some dissension in the ranks perhaps as Benoit explains that the only way anyone can beat the Canadian Crippler is by sheer luck. Pillman tells Benoit that he isn't living up to the Horseman name. The loose cannon then goes after Double A and Arn Anderson reminds Pillman that the Horseman's job is to protect Ric Flair and the world title. Brian Pillman shouldn't be running around starting fights with the likes of Paul Orndorff and the Dungeon of Doom when there really is no need to fight these guys. Just then, the Taskmaster and the Zodiac walk down the ringside but the Giant stops his Dungeon of Doom stablemates from getting into the ring. So yeah, those were the segments and matches that went up against the Raw Bowl and Nitro was much more entertaining here. I appreciate the WWF's efforts in trying something new and the Raw Bowl match itself isn't all that bad when you strip away the football theme, but Nitro's opening 25 minutes or so was better than Raw's. Lex Luger and Sting are going to take on the Super Assassins on Nitro, while Raw shows us the Arkansas Hog Pen match from In Your House 5, Hunter Hearst Helmsley vs Henry Godwin. Before the In Your House replay, we get a halftime report from Doc Hendricks, which was basically a reskinned slam jam segment. 
Doc tells us about the Royal Rumble pay-per-view while talking like an over-exaggerated sports reporter. The WWF then air near enough the whole Arkansas hog pen match. The only real edits come during the commercial breaks. Truly lazy stuff here from the World Wrestling Federation. And I know these were taped shows and I know they had to fill time, but there are other ways to do that. I'm not going to sit through this all again. Hunter Hearst Helmsley gets the win by back body dropping Henry into the hog pen, but Hunter ends up getting a little dirty too. Nitro presents Sting and Lex Luger versus the Super Assassins. Who are the Super Assassins, I hear you ask? Well, it's the Barbarian and Warlord, better known as the Powers of Pain. The Powers of Pain versus Sting and Lex Luger sounds much more appealing, but anyway, let's see what happens. Remember, Sting and Luger were in that triangle match at Starcade, yet here they are, still friends and still teaming together. Get prepared to enjoy some tiny split-screen action reminiscent of four-player Goldeneye on Nintendo 64, because Sergeant Craig Pittman interrupts the commentary team and this time he is seeking guidance from Steve Mongo McMichael. Mongo turns down the chance of a lifetime by telling the pit bull that his hands are full as a commentator, the exact same excuse Bobby Heenan gave Pittman two weeks ago. I had to go back and watch the opening of the match again on the micro split screen and the match starts off with Lex Luger and Sting dominating the Super Assassins. By the way, the Super Assassins were known individually as Super Assassin 1, who was actually the Barbarian, and Super Assassin 2, who was previously known as the Warlord. By the time we get back to the action, the Super Assassins have taken the fight to the outside of the ring. The Stinger gets dropped on the guardrails and then he gets stretched inside the square circle. The Super Assassins double team Sting, the referee misses a tag to Lex Luger that gives the Super Assassins even more opportunities to punish the WCW icon. But the Stinger is able to make the tag when a top rope splash is missed by Super Assassin 1. The Torture Rack and the Scorpion Deathlock get applied at the same time and the Babyfaces win the match. Point for Nitro, pay-per-view match replays aren't going to win many points here on Reliving the War. Diesel and King Mabel are up next on Raw while Nitro gives us a promo featuring the Giant and Jimmy Hart. Incredibly, we are told that the British Bulldog vs Bret Hart match from In Your House 5 will be shown next week on Raw, so you can consider that another easy point for WCW on the next Reliving the War, unless WCW seriously drop the ball and air something ridiculous, but let's wait and see. Poor Jeff Hardy can be seen carrying Mabel to the ring here and he looks like he's struggling too. Diesel comes to the ring to a great ovation and the match is 8 seconds long. 8 seconds long. Diesel hits the big boot, he goes for the pin and it's all over. Sir Mo takes the jackknife powerbomb afterwards and Big Daddy Cool leaves with the raw bold queen who has been set beside Jerry Lawler this whole time. Remember, the WWF aired a match from In Your House 5. They are going to end their show with a pre-recorded bashing of WCW. They aired a Doc Hendricks halftime update. And then they decided to give Nash and Mabel 8 seconds in the ring. I know the Diesel vs Mabel match at SummerSlam 1995 was woeful, but so much more could have been done here. I've seen the expected comments too about reliving the war being one sided so far and I'm apparently biased towards WCW. I completely expected such comments no matter which way I scored the show so it doesn't bother me, I'm happy for the engagement. But there is absolutely no defending the WWF here and trust me, I don't want this series to be one-sided either, but the World Wrestling Federation did present some absolute dire television during this era that was jam-packed with fillers and time-wasting segments. There's nothing at all that can justify it. Still, WCW's dark days are yet to come full force, so I'll shut up and move on to the next segments. The Giant and Jimmy Hart come out on Nitro for an interview with Mean Gene Okerlund. Jimmy Hart says that Hulk Hogan always said to keep your enemies close, but but the Hulkster didn't take his own advice when it came to the mouth from the south. The Giant rightfully says that Hulk Hogan screwed him out of the WCW Championship two weeks ago on Nitro, but every dog has its day and the Giant is coming after the Hulkster. Point for Nitro, at least WCW presented something a little more meaningful here. 
It's time for the final segments. We have Hulk Hogan vs Ric Flair over on Nitro while Raw gives us a Royal Rumble update along with the very first Billionaire Ted skit. Before the WWF begins taking shots at World Championship Wrestling, the Brooklyn Brawler presents the Smoking Guns with the Lombardi Trophy. The Smoking Guns break the Cardboard Award and the Brawler gets a kicking from everyone in the locker room. That's gratitude for you. We then get to see some Royal Rumble competitors. McMahon says that Diesel was the first man to sign up for the Rumble match and interestingly Bam Bam Bigelow was announced for the 1996 Royal Rumble match. Bigelow wouldn't compete in the Royal Rumble and the Beast from the East decided to pack his bags and go to ECW instead. Tatanka would also be making his return at the Royal Rumble event but it's the next announcement that is truly noteworthy. Vader was going to make his WWF debut at the 1996 Royal Rumble. People make a big deal out of the guys WCW managed to snatch away from the World Wrestling Federation during this time period, but Vader coming to the WWF was a big deal here and many fans were curious as to how Vader would fit into the World Wrestling Federation. So good stuff here from the WWF, props where it's due. Next up is the Billionaire Ted skit. We see guys dressed up as Ted Turner, Hulk Hogan, Mean Gene Okerlund and Randy Savage sitting in a boardroom meeting. Billionaire Ted says that WCW needs more action from its top stars. The Razor's Edge and the Jackknife Powerbomb are shown on a projector and the Huckster and the Nacho Man say that they can't perform such moves. When the Huckster is asked if he can perform an aerial move from the top rope, the Hogan impersonator says his feet don't leave the floor nowadays and it ain't gonna happen anytime soon. Billionaire Ted then asks his aging wrestlers exactly what can they do. The Nacho Man and the Huckster look at each other and they begin doing their signature poses. A voiceover says that you can't teach old dogs new tricks and the WWF are on top of the hill, not over it. It will be interesting to see how WCW replied to this next week on Nitro, if they replied at all. But yeah, interesting segments here from the WWF and a little retribution too. It's been a bit of a slog trying to get through this episode to be fair. Also if you want to learn more about the Billionaire Ted skits, check the link that you should see on the screen right now. Over on Nitro, the Hulkster has a chance to prove that he isn't over the hill as Hulk Hogan challenges Ric Flair for the WCW World Heavyweight title. Hulk starts things off in the driver's seat, making the new 12-time WCW champion look like easy work until Flair gets Hogan in the corner for some signature chops and punches. It doesn't last long though, Hogan begins no-selling the Nature Boy's offense and Rick takes the classic top rope bump, allowing Hogan to take control once again. The two men end up on the outside of the ring and the no selling continues, Hogan gets launched into the guardrail and he acts like it didn't hurt a single bit. The world's heavyweight champion is being forced to beg for mercy as the immortal Hulk Hogan isn't giving much up here in the early portion of the match. A poke to the eye helps Ric Flair turn things around, the nature boy then begins targeting Hulk Hogan's knee and the figure 4 is applied. When Hogan reverses the pressure, Jimmy Hart makes an appearance to distract the Hulkster. Flair is able to deliver a nice vertical suplex that makes Hogan quiver in the ring. I mean, he looks like he's having a hard time here. But no, Hogan powers out of a pin attempt and he begins hulking up. We see the big boot and the leg drop. And as the Hulkster goes for the pin, Jimmy Hart jumps on the apron to cause a distraction. Now, follow along here. Arn Anderson jumps into the ring with brass knucks, but Hogan is able to take care of double A. Hulk Hogan takes the weapon away from Anderson and the Hulkster shows the knucks to the referee. The referee then calls for the bell and Hulk Hogan wins via disqualification. Hogan looks pleased with the victory even though he couldn't win the title via DQ and even though Anderson didn't even get a chance to hit Hogan with the brass knucks anyway. A confusing and weird ending to this match here. The four horsemen and the giant try to attack Hogan but Randy Savage makes the save. The Zodiac keeps the giant from re-entering the ring. And yeah, keep this in mind, it's kind of important later. The Nacho Man and the Huckster cut a promo to end Nitro with Scheme Gene. The Babyfaces challenge the Enforcer and the Nature Boy to a match next week on Nitro. Hogan puts over his opponents by saying he will take on all four members of the Four Horsemen and make them look like Shetland ponies. It's a point for Raw here. Flair vs Hogan didn't live up to the hype and it was incredibly predictable. The Savage and Hogan promo afterwards is now beginning to feel like deja vu here on Reliving the War.
The first half of Nitro was better than the whole Raw Bowl match in my opinion. Raw Bowl wasn't bad but the Nitro matches and promos were better, particularly Benoit vs Regal. Sting and Lex Luger vs the Super Assassins was better than re-watching the Arkansas Hogpen match, while the Giants promo on Nitro carried things forward for WCW, while Diesel and Mabel completely wasted our time. Finally, the Vader Royal Rumble announcement and the Billionaire Ted skit proved to be more entertaining than Flair vs Hogan. If you want a perfect example of a by the numbers Hulk Hogan match during this era of WCW, look no further than the January 1st 1996 episode of Monday Nitro. A lot of ups and downs this week on Reliving the War but Nitro wins it, meaning our overall scores are 4 points to Raw, 9 points to Nitro and we've had 3 ties. Raw narrowly beat Nitro in the television ratings, scoring a 2.6 while Nitro managed a 2.5. Thanks for watching Reliving the War and I hope you join me next week when the Horsemen take on Hogan and Savage on Nitro, while a certain tough SOB makes his very first appearance ever on Monday Night Raw. Again, thank you for watching.